Yeah. Hello, um, I'm Mike Harrison. I'm sure some of you will be familiar with my YouTube channel where I take stuff apart and find out why it's a really bad idea to take things like fuel cells to pieces. Um, today, what I'm going to be talking about is actually my day job, which is designing custom electronics, generally for large-scale lighting installations of, of various sorts, typically involving ludicrous numbers of LEDs, um, often in same time insane time scales. Um, but th this one I thought was interesting because there's some construction techniques I came up with which might be of interest to smaller scale projects and be usable for other applications. So basically I've been talking to some designers that I've worked with over the years um, and they sort of pitched various ideas to, for retail and for various other um, sort of architectural type things. And for a long time we've been talking about Let's try and make something just using printed circuit boards so we've got structure and electrical connection yeah, in one place. It also means we don't have to deal with mechanical manufacturers, which can be a real pain, um, sort of try and do, do everything in one. So this is the first idea we come up with, which is basically sort of L-shaped PCBs to make like this sort of cube form. And we got sort of partway through figuring out how this was going to work sort of mechanically, but th this project didn't happen. It was pitched and they decided they didn't have any budget for it. Um, so that, that was a couple of years ago. So um, more recently, um, one of these uh, people I work with has moved to Hong Kong and they started pitching around some of the uh, big shopping malls and they got a, a su succeeded with a pitch to a very high-end shopping centre in Hong Kong called Pacific Place. Um, this is all, you know, like designer brands everywhere. And this was quite a big space that needed filling with stuff for Christ you know, Christmas lights but not tacky, horrible Chinese Christmas lights, stuff that looked interesting. Um, so we thought, well, what are the themes, you know, Christmas themes, Hong Kong, where the weather's sort of like this but more humid? Well, snowflakes, obviously. I mean, it would be. Um, so we think, well, okay, we got the idea we're going to make something that looks vaguely like a snowflake. So how do we actually, you know, obviously it's too big to make in one piece, so how do we join all these pieces together? We, we like the idea of doing something modular where we could stick things together in different shapes to make different forms. Um, this is the first idea we had. These are a connector made by a company called AVX. If you're, incidentally, if you're ever after interesting ways of connecting boards together, AVX do lots of really cool connectors, uh, particularly for like the lead lighting industry. Um, this is our first idea. So these are basically back-to-back -back edge connectors. So you can just plug two PCBs in. And the attractive thing about that is it didn't require any connector on the PCB. It was just PCB with the edge that plugs straight in. So in principle, it reduces the cost of your board because you don't have to fit a connector to the board. So we sort of started working around out some ideas on this. But this didn't really work out because although you got this sort of nice electrical connection, we needed to add these additional plates just to get the mechanical stiffness. And because of the size of these connectors, it, it was all starting to get a bit too big. Um, just didn't, didn't really quite work out. Um, also, the um, yeah, purely just the, the, the space we needed, but also the fact that we were making these triangles and actually trying to, because these are inserted from the end, trying to do that on a triangle would mean it would actually be quite difficult to put together. We'd have to start putting chamfers on the end and it was all, all a bit messy. So, ha, ha, had a long think. And this was really what we wanted to end up with, something where we just snap these things together. So, um, this is what we en ends up using. Um, Trying to remember which order things are in here. So we've got these PCBs that snap in using these are plastic snap rivets, which are super cheap, super quick to install. Now, what you can't do is just mount two PCBs flat to flat because um, you need something to actively push to get maintain the electrical connection. Um, if you just do sort of two bits of flat PCB, the slightest movement means they're going to disconnect. You get um, creepage over time, and it's generally a, a really bad idea. I mean, if we'd had time to do put a lot of engineering time into this, maybe we could have made that work. But this was really we had like a fairly limited amount of time, so we had to go with a solution we just knew would work um, without risk. So I started looking at various options for spring contacts. There's quite a, no a lot of nice little surface mount spring contacts like this which I started looking at. Um, this is one of these things where having a paper catalogue is a lot nicer than just searching for stuff on the website because you quite often find stuff that's on the next page that's related, but you never find that just on a web search. So what we end up using is these. These are mobile phone SIM connectors. So we've got six contacts in a nice ready-made package that we can just mount in one operation onto the PCB as part of a normal surface mount flow soldering process. Um, and there's, there's quite a few varieties of these. We settled on one particular one by Molex because the, um, the thickness was just right. So we have our LED strip, we have our star, and we then have a spacer, which is also made of PCB. And the thickness of this connector just matched up nicely with, with a 1.6 millimeter PCB as a spacer. So these are actually really cheap. They're uh, 13p. You'll notice on here the quantity showed is zero. 
Basically, we cleared out the entire worldwide distributor stock of these things, um, 28,000 of them. Um, and again, because we were on a fairly tight time scale, we had to make sure we had the stock before we committed to the design. So we just had to go and just buy enough straight away before we pushed the button on anything else. So for a while, it was quite hard to get hold of these because we, we had them all. Um, so th these are the sort of the final components um, of the system. We've got um, this LED strip, which is a two-sided assembly. We've got a total of six RGBW LEDs on there. Now, the RGBW bit is quite important. Is there's a small section over there. Afterwards, you can come up and take a close look at that. But you'll see that actually looks it's quite nice sort of pastel colours. Um, because obviously our theme was snow and snowflakes, so we wanted quite a lot of white in there. And RGB by its own makes a horrible white. It just looks horrific because of the colour variations and the colour balancing. It just looks totally nasty. So by adding that white in there, it means you've got most of your light, which is white, is coming out as a fairly pure white. And then you can just use the RGB to tint and accent it. The other advantage is white is a ton more power efficient. So compared to generating bad white with RGB, compared to... Um, a standard white LED, it's something in the order of eight times more efficient in terms of the light you get out versus the power you put in. So that, that's another, another big advantage. So these are the components. We've got the, um, our star, the, um, the one on your bottom right, that's the star interconnect. So that provides the mechanical interconnect and also the electrical interconnect via these pads that touch the SIM, SIM card connectors on the strips. So on the strip, we've got these six RGB LEDs, RGBW LEDs. They're all wired in series, so we've got a 24-volt supply, and we're just using current limiting resistors, um, so we don't need to mess about too much with constant current power supplies. <coughs> That's then driven by a PIC. Uh, I'll go into a little bit more detail there. That's a, a PIC uh, 12F322 from memory, I believe, no, I believe uh, which is a nice low-cost device, and I'll go into the details uh, in a sec as to why that was a really uh, almost ideal device for this um, project. Sorry, I, I, I like it. So, um, 12F1501. Uh, Incidentally, in this presentation, there is one mistake. If anyone can shout out when they see that mistake, I'll give them a free one of my prototyping boards. So just shout mistake. Um, it's, it's a little bit further on, but uh, it is a very obvious mistake to, to anyone that knows what they're talking. I just spotted it when I was reading through it a minute ago. Um, so the, the, there's some more details. Obviously, that, that gives us our star flake. We've got these strips. We can snap them together in almost any hexagonal arrangement we like. Then we've got the drop attachment, the things these are actually hung from. So we've got this thick PCB. It needed to be a little bit thicker than standard PCB just to, to get the rigidity. So at the bottom, you can see the actual shape. Um, that, that was, I did quite a lot of iterations. I've got one of these little cheap CNC engravers that was really handy for cutting out these test pieces. So that basically just snaps into a slot in, that, in, the, in the centerpiece. And we've got this right angle pin header that just plugs into the socket on the, um, the, the black part you can see on the right. So as long as you're careful and line the pins up so they don't bend, these snap together really, really easily. Because of course, once this vertical is in, it's a, ra a rather unwieldy thing to, to carry. So we've got these things um, yeah, manufactured flat. They're all assembled flat and packed. And then when we came on site, we snapped these vertical pieces on. Then the other detail on the left is how the um, hanging cable connects. So we've got this... Um, sort of hook on the end, so the cable loops through it twice, that gives us our mechanical strain relief, and then it plugs in. There's a little notch there, so we could actually put a cable tie around there, which is actually fairly unnecessary, but it, it reassured the client a little bit that it wasn't going to fall down. Um, you'll notice there's a couple of holes on, the, on that bottom piece. There's a couple of holes. The idea is that we'd snap it in, then we could put a wire through it as an extra safety precaution. Again, that's something that we told the client, yeah, well, yeah, they're a bit wide. If you actually try, you almost, it's almost impossible to pull one of these apart. They're very, very strong. Um, in the end, we actually forgot to put those wires in and nobody noticed and it hasn't fallen down so I'm not too concerned about that. <laughs> the only other thing we needed, because these were flat and obviously PCB is a bit flexible, uh, we actually had some put some suspension wires so what we did, we had a couple of holes in the vertical and then we had some um, custom wire forms made out of, I think it was something like half a millimetre stainless steel wire which had hooks preformed in the end. So again, something we did on site was we put the things out flat, we plug the vertical in, we then threaded these wires through, and that then kept the whole thing flat, so you suspend it and it, it holds itself um, nice and flat. And you can see on the right, you can see how that hook, it's like a V-shaped hook, so you just push it through and it snaps through, so it's really quick to assemble. You go snap, snap, and it, it, it all holds together. And these have been pre-made on a machine that get, gets the length precisely right, so all the, uh, obviously the length of that wire is critical to get it totally flat, so that had to be got just right. 
Um, the other thing we did, obviously we've got an array of these snowflake shapes. Now, if you just hang them, they're going to sort of twist and rotate relative to each other. And of course, we wanted to do nice pattern sweeping across it and like coordinated shapes across the whole thing. So we needed to stop them rotating. So we had these additional pieces, which again, use the same snap in detail. Um, and at the other end of this strip, it just passes through a slot. There's no fixing, it just passes through it. So that basically ties pairs together so they can't rotate relative to each other. So as long as each pair is linked, then they're all going to stay the same way around. And again, that, that was a, a quite neat solution. Again, yeah, all entirely made out of PCB, no extra parts. Um, I don't think... I don't think we actually... There were no, the only thing that wasn't a PCB was those mechanical uh, wires. Everything else is done... Yeah, standard electronic PCB process, which is you know, something that I, I'm familiar with and I don't like dealing with subcontractors in areas that I'm not familiar with because it gets too stressful. <laughs> we, we, we tend to speak uh, different languages. So back to the pick that we used. I don't know how sort of technical you are. Please go to sleep if this is, this is boring. I won't stay on this too long. It was a really nice fit for this project. It's got four PWM channels. Um, which means yeah, for RGBW, that's perfect. All the dimming is basically done completely in hardware. It's 10-bit. Now, that's important. You, you might think, well, you know, for doing dimming, all you need is 8 bits. That's actually not true. If you just want to do a nice fade from like completely off to completely on, if you use 8 bits, what you'll find is the bottom few, at the dim end, it'll get really steppy because the eyes, um, the eyes response to light is non-linear. So what you generally do if you want a nice smooth fade, literally all the way from black up to however bright it goes, you need a minimum of about 10 bits, and you then apply a curve, which is the opposite of yeah, the eye's response. In practice, a very good approximation to that is you simply take the 8-bit value, square it, and then use the top however many bits your hardware supports, and that, that works really nicely. And of course, commutationally, it's, it's really simple. These, these picks have only got, uh, I think, 5, 12 words of memory, so even a lookup table would have been a, a difficult, difficult to do, but all it's doing is it's taking the 8-bit value, multiplying it by itself, and slapping it out, that out to the PWM hardware. Um, some other nice features, it's got self-programmable flash, which means that we can upload the firmware over the cable. So this entire installation, we can up if we needed to, we could upload the firmware in every single pick. Um, there's 60 picks, uh, segments per snowflake. The total was about, I think, 14,000 strips in the entire installation. So obviously it's really important that if we needed to, we could update the firmware easily. Also, it can hold a device ID. It hasn't actually got E-squared PROM, but you can self-program the flash to achieve the same thing, and I'll go into that in a second. Um, it's got a, an internal oscillator that's act, act, accurate enough to do serial communication, so that's one less component we need to deal with. It's a, a 5-volt part. It'll run from anything from, I think, 2.5 up to 5 volts, so we don't need um, a precision... Um, yeah, voltage regulator, we just have a resistor and a zener diode to go from our 24 volt supply to our pick. Yes? Yes. See me afterwards for the prototype board, well done. <laughs> right, um, so yes, it's cheap, 50 cents, and one really, really th nice thing I like about picks is that Microchip will supply them ready programmed with your code for very, very little money, far, far cheaper than using a third-party pro programming service. So for another six cents, our chips already had all our, our, our code in it. Um, in fact, it, it, because we could upload the firmware, it actually, um, the thing that you really need is have, have a bootloader, um, because there were some changes I made to the firmware after we'd send off the order for the picks. But because they had the bootloader in there already, um, the jig you'll see in a moment, part of our, the programming process, we also uploaded new firmware to it. But the fact that we didn't have to stick these on an in-circuit programming jig, for, of course, like 14,000 boards, was a, a real-time saver. And also because the assembly was being done by a subcontractor in, in Hong Kong, you know, it's one less thing for them to screw up. We say, here's the chip, it's got the code in, stick it on the board and it works. And the other thing is it's got some built-in test facility so that when you turn it on, it'll cycle through all the colors of the LED. So again, for the subcontractor to be able to test it, all they had to do was power it up. And again, there's a slide further on about that. Quick detail, it doesn't have a UART, so we're doing 125K board serial, which is quite fast, but we can actually do a soft UART if we cut a few corners. In the, instead of the, the traditional approach of doing a soft UART is you basically have an interrupt on the start bit, and then you generate an interrupt on each bit that you want to sample. Now, once you get up to higher ball rates, that becomes a bit problematic because of the amount of time it takes to get you into and out of the interrupt routine. So what I do, we actually we still generate an interrupt on the start, bo start bit, but we stay inside the interrupt code for the entire duration of the byte, which means we can sample at... I mean, I've used this up to about half a megabit, and it works quite works fine. 
Um, we used an additional stop bit just to give us a bit of extra time to deal with um, getting in and out of the interrupt routine. Um, so I originally did this using DMX, which is actually a 250k board with, a, with two stop bits, and that extra stop bit really is a lifesaver. Um, the disadvantage of this is, is that your foreground processing uh, doesn't, if you've got this data streaming in continuously, every byte you get in takes up almost all of the processing time. Um, I, I'm not, that, that's a vaguely representative picture at the bottom, but fortunately, because we've got this hardware PWM, the only thing the foreground task is doing is waiting until the new packet comes in, saying, yes, I've got the packet, here's, here's my RGBW bytes, squaring it, throwing it out to the PWM hardware, so, and it's got a complete frame time of about 30 milliseconds to do that, so even if on every incoming byte, you only get like two, three or four instructions executed. That's fine. That still works, which is great, and it's cheap. Um, so this is just some of the detail of the um, this interconnect star. So it's a two-layer PCB. We've got um, plus 24 volts ground and data, and say so it's data. It's 125k TTL TTL level UART data, which works fine. Over we had I think, up to about 10 meters of cabling. Uh, we made sure that we didn't produce sort of nasty spikes. We sort of smoothed it off, so we got a nice sort of control rise times, and that, that works beautifully. And it'll, it'll work at twice that bit, bit rate, but we just didn't need that, so we decided let's, let's play safe and keep everything going as slow as possible to minimize the things that can go wrong. Now, within this um, Starflake shape, we've got 60 strips. Obviously, we need a consistent way of addressing those strips. They're all sharing the same data bus, remember. So we've got each strip sees this stream of data, and it needs to know, well, where am I? You know, which of these bytes in this incoming data do I need to respond to? So each strip has a unique ID programmed into it. And to do this, we made a jig. So our original idea was we'd, as well as programming, we also need, need something to um, help with the assembly, because these are going to be assembled by other people in Hong Kong under our supervision. So the idea was we'd get, say, a sheet of MDF, mill out the shape, then you just drop all the strips and stars in. The problem is that you know, we're here and that's in Hong Kong, and sending out a four-foot square sheet of MDF to Hong Kong is really not a very good idea. So I came up with this idea of making a modular jig, which again is made out of PCB. So the jig actually follows the same form as the shape that you're trying to create. We've got these strips, we've got the stars, we've got the p locating pins, so that what you do is you assemble this jig by again snapping it together with the snap rivets, you drop all the stars onto the jig, you drop all the strips onto the jig, you then push all the uh, snap rivets in, and that then gives you your physical structure of th that's the right shape. And also on these jig, we've got these little programming pins, and that's connected to a programming box, um, which is part of the jig system. So that once you've made, assembled it all, all up, you push it down, we use like crop clips and uh, bulldog clips just to hold it down to make sure it's making contact. And the jig would then generate data, and these, these pins effectively act like a chip select, so Remember, every, every board is seeing exactly the same data, so how do you know how to program that particular one? So we send a command that says, ID number 46, but only if you can see your pin being pulled low. So the jig just pulls each of these pins in turn, sends the ID command, and then each strip within the jig is programmed. We then do a test so we can see it all lighting up, we can see it's all in the right order, we can see everything's all got the, got the right address. And that, that process takes about sort of 15 seconds, I think, that entire process. Um, these are a few little details of the jig. Unfortunately, I, I forgot to take some decent quality pictures of these. Um, so you can see the various parts of the jig. You can see the strips here, the stars being ready to drop on. Um, there, That's the complete jig running through its test. So it, as it goes through its programming thing, the various colors on the ledge just indicate the progress. When it's finished, it flashes some fixed patterns, which are designed in such a way that, because the eye is very good at recognizing yeah, patterns that that are or aren't there, the eye can immediately spot in the error, so we can verify that all these have been programmed correctly. So that's the actual process of the, um, the snowflake itself. Um, in terms of the system as a whole, each of these snowflake, 60 strip snowflakes, plugged into one of these units, and what this does, this has got a high-speed RS-485 bus running between uh, two or three of them. That then takes data at two megaboard, and it then splits that out into 12 simultaneous streams at 125k board for 12, up to 12 um, snowflakes. The, the dark squares you can see on the right are polyfuses to provide protection. So obviously, um, each snowflake would take up to about 2 amps at 24 volts at full load. So we've potentially got um, 24 amps going through this thing. So we have this individual polyfuse protection to avoid sort of if they say a cable short to avoid setting anything on fire. Shopping centers really, really hate that. So you want to be, make sure smoke really gets them 
get, get, get some twitchy. So there's yeah, safety there. There's also some zeners and resistors so that if, for example, we had a short between our data line and our 24 volt line, it wouldn't blow anything up. It would just, uh, you know, just sit there and draw a little bit of current. So there's some little zener diodes and some resistors and some, I think we use some PTC polyfuses on the data lines as well. So just to make sure that it was pretty much idiot proof, you could do anything. It just wouldn't, wouldn't, yeah, the worst it would do is not work. It wouldn't set, yeah, kill anyone or set anything on fire. Um, this was part of the factory test. Like I said, having the firmware in the pick from the factory meant that we could do some tests. The, um, the strips were made in panels of, I think, something like 15 strips on a panel for the whole surface mount process. And we actually put some tracking around the panel so that you could take a complete manufactured panel, plug 24-volt power into it, and then all the strips on the thing would cycle through all the colors. So it meant the manufacturer could instantly check that all the LEDs were working, there weren't any shorts, um, very quickly and very easily. And again, yeah, uh, that's part of the instruction we give to the manufacturer. So hopefully what we get from them is pre-tested, known working strips ready to go on the jig. And also you've got that secondary test procedure once we go through the jig. But it means that any bad soldering or so on, in theory, that, that should be taken care of um, by the factory that's manufacturing the, the strips themselves. Right, that's the actual architecture. I've just got some video of this. Unfortunately, um, there is some video of the full thing with all the final animations. Unfortunately, no one's got around to editing it yet. So this is a mixture of a build video and also some footage I shot on site with some test footage, test animation, because I left Hong Kong before they'd finished doing all the programming stuff. So this is just a sort of general overview thing. I've edited some of, some of the boring stuff out of here, but this is part of the actual man, yeah, process of installing. Um, test, that's me going around testing every single drop wire before it got lifted, make sure all the cabling's working. So these were put, there was a custom framework made that was put on winches and then the, it was winched up, the snowflakes were put on in sort of height order. And it was then just gradually winched up and more snowflakes put on, then winched up and more pulled up and then pulled up to the final final height. So this is the big installation in the, um, the main foyer, it's like a Christmas tree type shape. And then around the sides there were some long thin installations, there's, there's like, it's like a sort of round building with like thin corridors that go all the way around it. So we've got this big feature thing at the front. And then around the sides we've got these thinner parts which I think are, yeah, here, here are the side bits. The nice thing, because it's this nice open shape, it's very transparent, it doesn't look like a huge sort of thing. We're filling a lot of volume, but we're not really making it like a big lump in the space because it's very transparent. Um, you know, you can actually see through it quite nicely. Um, and when the snowflakes are off, you know, you, you hardly even notice they're there. But obviously when they come on, you see the light, you get some really nice reflections from this, this curved glass. So you look up, you see the things, you can see the reflections from the glass, the, um, the curved glass, which is uh, quite, quite a nice effect. So the overall aesthetic, I mean, the, the end client was absolutely delighted. We're actually going back in October, to, we're gonna take the strips, we're gonna rearrange them into things that look like, less like snowflakes on different frames, and we're gonna put them back up again um, as a sort of permanent um, installation. So these are the ones that are down the sides. There are four different clusters which are just sized and shaped to fit the, basically the, the shape of the space we had to uh, put them in. So you can see this nice reflection on the uh, lift shaft, this cur curved glass on the lift shaft on the left is this really nice reflection of this, um, this cluster here. So unfortunately I don't have, yeah, there were some quite nice animations that were done, but um, unfortunately I don't have any I think at the end there's some really grotty video that actually some guy in Hong Kong, you know, I found it on YouTube, someone had been through the shopping centre and actually videoed it, so I've, I've just stolen a few snippets from that video just to show some of the animations, but it's, uh, it's rather poor quality, but saying I need to go and kick someone and get, get them to um, actually edit all the footage they've got of the, um, the final thing, so that was all shot quite nicely, but just it's been sat on a hard disk for a long time. So th these were just me just wandering around, waving a camera just to get something. But you get some quite interesting, yeah, you because know, they're flat. You, you know, as the angle changes, you get different sort of impressions of it, from sort of high density to low density, and so on. Um, yeah, I think this is the yeah, this is the footage, of the animation. They say this is a rather bad YouTube uh, grab, but you can get some idea of the animation. I think on every hour it, they played a tune through the PA. Cause remember, this was Christmas themes. So they played some jolly Christmas tune through the PA system. We had this animation that made them all, you know, do all cool sort of funny animation color things and then it went back to a more sort of passive sort of gentle background thing in between that. Yeah, so you can see some, we're sort of generating some shapes with these animations based around that, that hexagonal um, shape. But, um, 
Yeah, I'll, I'll leave that playing. So we've got five minutes. Any quick questions? Yeah. Oh, someone's going to come to you with a microphone. I've got this spotlight in my face. It's a bit hard to see. Hi. Um, could you tell us something about the, the, the software used to generate these animations? Was that you or someone else? That basically, or? for almost all these ins installations, my responsibility generally ends at the USB port. Yeah, yeah. So the most I do is some software just to fire it all up, find the addresses and test it. All the creative stuff I leave to creative people. It's not really my, my, something I have anything to do with. It was, running, it was running on a Mac Mini. That's about all I know. <laughs> okay. Any more questions? Any more? You have that? Oh, my, yeah, you showed us the boards which have uh, like a megabit coming in and several lower yeah. board rate. Um, what was providing those megabit um, streams to feed no, all that of those? That was coming out of a quad um, USB to RS-485 interface. That's so just got an FTDI, FTE4232H. Um, it's basically, they're made by a subsidiary of FTDI called EasySync. They do these nice industrial boxes, um, which I use all the time. And RS-485 is a really good way of getting a crap load of data out of a PC. Easily, cheaply, easy to debug. It's, it's a lot easier than Ethernet in a lot of respects. Thanks. And how long did it take to put up? Um, each of the big clusters was one night, and I think the, the big front one was two nights. We obviously, because it's shop, said we can only work overnight. So, yeah, we made good progress. We had some contingency, but we did. It was, you yeah, know, damn hard work, but we, we did actually. We had, the thing is, we had a really good installation crew. Um, that, you know, for example, assembling the, those suspension wires. You, you know, we showed these guys how to do it once, and they were just on it, and they just did it beautifully. It was really good. Yeah, that saved us a ton of time, the fact that we could just show them how to do it, and just, it, we knew it would get done, it would get done right. Any more? Yeah, this one. Oh. Um, what was the total power draw of one of those clusters, just um, approximately? The li one limitation we had is the only power we had was a number of 13-amp sockets in the proximity of each, each section. So some of the design constraints actually came from that. Um, so each snowflake was uh, about 57 watts. So it's 24 volts um, at... Two, no, must have been about two and a half amps. We did actually have, we did actually look at, I think the software did actually have like a metering thing so we could actually measure from the content how much power it was going to draw and if necessary we could cap that because obviously we didn't want to be, any fuses to be blowing, blowing. But I think in the end we did actually have a system where we could, if we wanted, run it up all, I think either all at 100% or three out of the four colours at 100%. How did you do in kind of manufacturing yield and failures and failures in the installation itself over its run? Um, we didn't have many failures. Um, obviously, we've got a lot of strips. So if one strip went down, it wouldn't be that noticeable. Um, I think it, 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 certainly in terms of dead strips from the factory when we were assembling, there was about half a dozen out of 14,000. Um, failures during the installation, I don't have the figures, but it wasn't a huge number. It was no more than tens, I don't think. Um, I think yeah. this is yeah. possibly last question. Yeah. yeah, last question. Right. So you've got a lot of LEDs in a fairly small space. Um, yeah. Was there any sort of consideration for like the thermals of it? Or no, it, it just... it basically because they're all spread out, it just isn't an issue. I mean, for, for things where, where I'm generating fairly bright lights, where possible I would sooner, for example, use a, a cluster of six small LEDs than one big power LED because that heat is spread out so you don't need a metal clad PCB. I, you know, you can run that flat out. It will get a little bit warm, but no more than that. And also because we're using white, the white LEDs, the white is so efficient, we can get a really decent amount of brightness. I mean, those LEDs are running at, I think, about 15 milliamps. They're not even running at their full power. Right. Okay. Um, this one. one back, Were you waving back? at the back? No, he's just fanning himself. Okay. Um, can we thank Mike, please? Yeah. So if you want to have.